Okay, well, it's our great pleasure this morning to uh, welcome to this uh, ERA for Change conference, uh, none other than the father of reconciliation in Australia and the uh, current senator for WA, uh, Patrick Dodson. So, Senator Dodson, welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Phil, and uh, I'm very privileged to uh, to be part of this. And I want to say uh, good day to all the all the students, particularly, but to anyone else that uh, takes the time to um, listen to our conversation on reconciliation. Great. Well, look, the people that are that attending this uh, conference and the workshops today, Pat, are from um, across the schools of the Edmund Rice Network, and these are people who've chosen to to come to to this session particularly. So they're young emerging leaders, they're, they're people who have, uh, have a very important role to play now, but also in the future. And I guess given your position as, you know, Royal Commissioner, Chair of the Aboriginal Reconciliation Council, uh, and now a Senator, and a life involvement in reconciliation, what do you think are the important lessons that young leaders need to know about the history of reconciliation? Well, I think it's, it's terribly important to understand that um, reconciliation emerges from the peculiarity of the Australian settlement history, that it emerges from the fact that there was no agreement, there's no treaty, uh, there was no accommodation of the First Nations people's aspirations or wishes or their rights, really. So we founded this nation on this concept of terra nullius, that there was no one here. That obviously was overturned by the High Court. And what we haven't dealt with the legacy of um, the policies and the administration uh, programs that have been put in place since 1788 up to the current day. We've done a few good things. We've, 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 we uh, gave the Commonwealth Government in 1967 a power to make laws for Aboriginal people. Because up until that period, they had no power under the Constitution to make laws for Aboriginal people. And since then, there's been a bit more uh, enlightenment around public policy going towards uh, trying to get equity as citizens in this nation. Uh, and so reconciliation became a bit more couched in terms of um, programs and policies that lead towards a greater sense of uh, equality as a citizen of Australia. And the political component, that is, as owners of this land, not having been compensated or entering into any treaty, has been pushed to one side, except until recent days. And in recent days, we've had um, the Uluru Statement, of course, which is an important uh, statement, which talked about three things, a voice uh, to the parliament uh, for First Nations, and that voice being entrenched in the constitution, and uh, talking about a Makarata Commission, that is a, 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 um, a process of truth-telling that leads to a healing of the, of the various causes for our discord and our dis disagreements from the, the way we interpret our settlement narrative. So historically, uh, the country has not been terribly um, uh, sympathetic towards dealing as equals with First Nations people. They have uh, sought to subjugate them uh, and make them uh, responsive to public policies determined by, primarily by the governments of the day. That's always been resented by First Nations and, and, and so we've had protests and resistance. Uh, and that legacy is still continuing, the legacy of resistance to governments. I was going to ask you that that notion of historically pre-67 when people, you know, the, the notion of... of uh not even been counted in the census, and then pre, um, I guess, native title this decisions, people were sort of not counted as full citizens of the country, and yet reconciliation became sort of about delivering programs that should have been people's right as a citizen. How, how, did, how did Aboriginal people feel about that? Well, I think it, it, if you, in recent days, it obviously goes to the Barunga Festival and the statement by the Prime Minister at the time, Mr Hawke, who promised to the Aboriginal people that there would be a treaty after uh, almost 150 years of occupation of these lands, that there'd be a treaty between the Aboriginal people and the nation to deal with the unresolved business. Um, that, of course, didn't go down well with the conservative side of politics, 
who said, no, we've got to deal with the programs, the practicalities that will get um, levels of equity or levels of equality mm. for Aboriginal people because they saw anything like a treaty as going to um, creating a division within the nation rather than it being healed. When yeah. Bob Hawke couldn't, couldn't just um, deliver on the treaty we set about nationally mm. on a 10 year process under a council set up under legislation uh, by the federal parliament to try and promote discussion and create understanding and to get activities um, engaged in by businesses, local government, interest groups and, and First Nations peoples because we don't have a history of uh, agreement making. So we had to cultivate, try and cultivate an agreement making uh, ethos within our nation polity um, in order for us to look at the more serious issues of how Aboriginal people came to be dispossessed and therefore what are the rights of compensation uh, and uh, restoration that we need to engage in. That's what you refer to as the unfinished business of our history, eh? That's, that's right, that's the unfinished business. And uh, of course, when the Reconciliation Council uh, delivered its final report and the people marched across the bridges in Sydney and other places, uh, they delivered by a roadmap uh, to the government, which was about uh, program management and program delivery, but also a draft piece of legislation that talked about um, uh, setting up a process to deal with the unfinished business. Mm -hmm. And that was never picked up, of course, by the government of the day. So we're back to, uh, in current times, we're back now with a, with a uh, process being embarked upon by the current minister with about 60 people with, through three committees, uh, co-designing legislation and potentially a referendum question for the entrenchment of a set of words in the constitution for the voice. Now, that process is, is lagging seriously behind time. Yeah. Um, if it's going to get into this parliament, uh, it, it looks very doubtful. So the future of um, the voice to the parliament and a constitutional entrenchment of that voice is something that is, is within the grasp of, um, of the government, but the government's refused to, to give it political priority. Okay, so that's, so that's the situation now, where we are right now. So the challenge is to make that a reality, to get that, that agreement making, to get the enshrined in the constitution. What, what are the current barriers and what are the opportunities to assist that happening? Well, the first thing is that the, um, the, there is a, a dual process at the moment. There's the process of uh, co-design in, in the broad uh, with the 60 or so Australians, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people, working on drafting a bill or setting up the heads for a bill to be drafted to give a shape to a voice to the parliament. That means to, now, make, hopefully the, to make the laws, isn't it? Make the laws for that to be, to be set up. Well, it, it would comment on laws that are going to affect Aboriginal right. people. And, and seek from the government an explanation of uh, the underpinning direction of those laws and their impacts. Mm. So hopefully to give a greater insight to government in the way they legislate for the, for the best things in, in Aboriginal affairs, help guide them, I suppose, to better outcomes. Now, some people don't agree with that. They think this would be a separate chamber that, that will abs absolutely uh, um, hold parliament accountable to First Nations people. But that, that, that will never happen. It won't happen. So this is about a, giving to First Nations people a, a means through which they can interface with the Parliament of Australia and comment that they can't bind the Parliament, but to comment on laws and policies that are going to affect First Nations people. They want that entity to be enshrined in the Constitution. So mm -hmm. it can't be just dismissed if the government of the day doesn't like the advice that they're getting or the comments that they're receiving from this voice. It's, along with that is a truth-telling process which needs to be embarked upon. That is the truth about how, we be, how this nation became settled, the truth about the policies that governments have been embarked upon, the good and the bad aspects of those, the truth of the local histories, of the massacres that have occurred, uh, the displacement of the people, and, and the good things about some of those things as well. So a truth thing that hopefully it will lead to a healing of our nation and give us a greater sense of why an agreement, why a treaty is so essential to, for us to create the unity that we need as a nation. 
And that process is called the reconciliation process. Mm -hmm. so there's a political component to it. There's this practical, pragmatic process uh, where the peak organisations now, like Nacho and other uh, legal services and others, are in fact working with COAG, the uh, heads of, heads of the, uh, the various governments of Australia, to look at the closing the gap kind of challenges. Mm -hmm. So how can they work collaboratively with advice uh, and direction from First Nations organisations yeah. to do things about health, housing, education, children's support and, and so forth. So ultimately you need regional autonomy in the hands of Aboriginal people to administer the public sector programs and to hold accountable the agencies for the delivery of the outcomes that you expect to see from those public sector inputs that go in. Yeah. So there's a two-pronged approach here. One is the minister is trying to get legislation sorted. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have this very practical uh, in intervention by the peak organisations that exist with the uh, leaders, the current leaders of the various parliaments saying, well, this is the way we think you ought to go about your policies in this space. Uh, now that's a good thing. Bringing that together, and I think the young people of today, if they become aware of the dynamics that are at play here, one, they need to be, be clear, they get clarity about the voice. Where's this going? Okay. What's the legislation? Yep. How, how's it going to improve uh, the regional autonomy, the administration of the public sector funds? And uh, how is that being improved now? And they need to understand that the truth telling needs to happen so that we can get to a, a, a more unified nation state and, the, and that we need to deal with our complexity yeah. of our society, not just with the legacy of the British. We now have a multicultural society and we have to deal with that in a unified way. Well, you just mentioned the young people. Now, you're talking to an audience of, um, of a group of young people who are emerging leaders, who, um, who are one of the questions they keep asking us is, well, what can we do? What can we do? What, what, what would your advice be to the young people that you're talking to right here about what they can do to become supporters of reconciliation? Well, the first thing I'd do, and I'd start at the, at the level of the Reconciliation uh, uh, Australia, the Reconciliation Australia Council, and find out who in their area has got a reconciliation action plan. Mm -hmm. and, and then contact those, those businesses or those entities and say, how, what are you doing through your plan? And how effectively is it addressing the objectives and goals that you've set up? And then secondly, I'd go to the, the next question to be asked is where, and I'll ask me local member, where are we at with the voice to the parliament? And, and why is it taking so long for the government to get to a position to enact legislation for that voice to be put into place to assist the parliament to make better laws for Aboriginal people. And then thirdly, I'd be saying, well, where do we go with the outcomes from the Uluru statement and the truth telling and the agreement making process? Because we need to create a unified Australia. We don't want to continue having this blue every time Australia Day comes around or, yeah. or uh, you know, some other topical thing seems to arise. Australia's got to be united. And we have to accept the diversity and the complexity of our history and its richness, as well as its, its uh, not very savoury aspects of it as well. So that it all has to be brought together in a mature uh, way with truth and justice that leads to a, a liberating of the, the nightmares that some of us go through when we think about how hard this is to, uh, to achieve. Well, I think... Um that might be something the young people themselves might consider putting together a reconciliation action plan to do those things for themselves, for ERA for change, and then to re review that. But the other point I've got is, like, young people have a very important role to play in this, don't they? Oh, absolutely. They're critical. Why? They're absolutely critical. They're, they're critical to this because it's their future. And, and they've got a lot of things now to guide them. They've got the Mabo judgment. They've got the activities of the Reconciliation Council. They've got uh, the uh, operations of the Native Title Act. You know, there's a whole lot of goodwill in Australia, despite what sometimes we see at the political level. And, and they've, got the, they've got the capacity to shape the future parliaments of our country. So 
that's only one aspect of it. But they're the people who hold uh, the kind of uh, aspirations that determine what politicians do. And, and they don't have to go into the parliament. Some of them hopefully will, but they don't have to go into the parliament to let the parliamentarians know that the time has come for us to move beyond the, the, the arguments that we've had to date. And let's get to a place where we can reconcile the legacy of our history and the unsatisfactory nature of the status of the First Nations peoples. Well, Patrick, on that note, can we uh, just say thank you for your time? I know how busy you are moving between Broome and Canberra regularly, which is, I think is equivalent of a Sydney to Dubai flight, if there was one available. Um, it's a hell of a journey and a hell of an uh, effort you put in. Just finally, uh, just what keeps you going? You've been doing it for a long time and you're more, I hear you're more passionate about it now than you've ever been. What keeps you going? <laughs> uh, it's good people like you, Phil. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's that we are a nation capable. We've just seen we're capable of responding to great challenges. This uh, COVID virus has indicated that we're capable of responding to great things. Now's the time for us to say, let's look at the legacy issues in the social sector of our society and let's try and fix some of those up, like the homelessness situation of, a, of many of our people in this country and First Nations issues. It's time to fix those up and go forward in a, in a better civil society than the one we had prior to the COVID virus. All right, Pat, on that note, thank you to the young people. Thank you for your, uh, for your listening. Uh, it's, uh, and I wanna thank Patrick, who's uh, one of our national leaders, um, certainly one of the major figures, if not the major figure in reconciliation in Australia for many years. And he's taken time today to come and, and share uh, some time with you. And I think that's an indication of the measure of the guy. Patrick, thank you very much. Senator Dodson. All the best to all you young people.